All right, well, let's take our Bibles this morning and let's go to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter number 3. 2 Timothy, chapter number 3. Years ago, there was a hydroelectric dam that was to be built across a valley in the state of Maine. The people in the town were to be relocated and the town itself submerged. During the time between the initial decision and the completion of the dam, the town, which had been well kept up, fell into disrepair. Why keep it up now? Was the, was the thought. One resident explained it this way, where there is no faith in the future, there is no work in the present. And I'd like to build upon that thought here today because we're going to be venturing into a new series I've called The Prophetic Perspective. The Prophetic Perspective. You know, we can get down and disheartened by the news that we are continually bombarded with every single day and if we're not careful that negativity can trans uh, trans be transplanted into this heart and actually disengage us from living out the way God wants us to live and to, to, to negate us from living with the eternity in view instead we want to live, be people who live with eternity in view seeing things from a big picture perspective as that will dictate what we believe is important and unimportant in our life and what we do with ourselves each day. To kick off our series, we're going to look at Paul's final letter of admonition and instruction to his apprentice, Timothy. And within this letter, Paul shares some helpful information about our time frame, known as the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, <clears throat> boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Today I'd like to kick off our series with a message I've entitled, The Current World's Chaos. <laughs> the Current World's Chaos. Let's pray first. Father, we thank you for the scriptures that unlock our understanding to the world in which we live. And Lord, we thank you for what you promise in your word for things to come. And as we dig into this subject matter today, and as we contemplate these truths from thy word throughout this series, may it give us confidence and faith for our future so that there will be work in the present instead of no work at all. Lord, we know that, our, uh, that the time is short, but Lord, we thank you for these days, which are actually quite exciting when you think about where we sit in the scope of it all. God, please bless this time and help us see this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, within our text, we see the phrase, the last days, the last days. And what is this referring to particularly? Well, within the scriptures, there's various terms that are used to describe these days. Words like, again, the last days, that also mentions the term latter days or latter times or last time. It's all referring to a period of time, I believe, started around the time of Jesus Christ. In fact, Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2 kind of shed some light on that. It says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, the Old Testament era hath in these, notice, last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom, we have whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So we see here that Jesus Christ came and spoke in these last days and communicates to us some important truths about the days in which we live. And, in, and these last days refer to this time frame since the time of Jesus Christ. It includes all the events that will transpire between the time, that time, and the closing out of the pages of Scripture. Much of which we, I guess we might call, or might consider the New Testament era in which we live. Why is it the last days, though? Why, is, why, does, why are these terms used? Well, I believe a lot of it has to do in the fact that these are the days in which the current situations and the current way the, the universe is run is coming to a close. In other words, things are going to be changing. They're not always going to be like this 
thankfully. <laughs> That, that, that the, there will be, there's going to be a closing of this chapter in history and there will be a, an opening of a new eventually here that is far better. Also in these days are really Satan's final days. Satan's days are numbered. And he knows that. And as a result, he's on a rampage against God trying to overthrow him because he was so badly beaten when Jesus Christ went to the cross and rose again. The Bible mentions Colossians 2, verses 14 through 15. talks about Christ's victory on the cross, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, those are demonic powers it's referring to, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In other words, he completely whipped the socks off of Satan at the cross. Before that... Satan had a grip on mankind that could not be broken. But as a result of the cross, it broke Satan's grip on mankind and opened up mankind for the opportunity to be reconciled with his creator. Before that, that wasn't necessarily possible. They were waiting for that to come in the Old Testament days. That was something that Satan fought so hard to prevent but failed to do so. And what seemed like a total victory for him when Jesus Christ died, bled and died on that cross as he did, was a total reversal. <laughs> and uh, he, got, he got shocked completely. And these are the final days in which Satan is trying to reverse the effects of the cross, which he won't, but will be also used of God, these time frames, to bring about his golden age. A golden age for all eternity, with sin and its propagators eradicated from the creation forever. In other words, sin will be gone. And what you and I experience and see in this world will cease to exist, which is going to be a good thing. It's going to be a very, very good thing. And these are the final days, and because Satan's bid to overthrow God, they are tumultuous days, to say the very least. They're difficult. You see in verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. <laughs> difficult times troublous times because Satan is doing his part to try to disrupt humanity which disrupts the spread of the gospel that puts of course people back in right relationship with God that message of redemption that puts people in, 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 a, self, in, in a position to be forgiven and of course this plays out in several forms around the world you look at geopolitical things around the world you, what you are really seeing <laughs> is demonic activity behind the scenes. The physical conflicts and the political conflicts are just a mirror image of the underlying spiritual conflicts going on in the unseen world. That's what it all is. It's all, this, all these things. Well, I thought it was just people that just don't know any better. Yeah, they don't know any better in some cases, but it's because there are demonic beings behind all this, influencing and, and, and persuading men and women, as it were, to do things that prevent the spread of the gospel, whether they realize it or not. That's what it's all, that's what this, all this stuff that's going on, all this intensity you see in the news, and all this stuff that you see uh, cropping up, it is the devil behind all of it, trying to disrupt and display and, and get people's minds away from the gospel, preventing the gospel from spreading amongst people groups and nations around the globe. That's what it's all about. And, he, and, he, and the bickering for power is connected to that. We did a study here on the book of Daniel during our 9.30 hour here a few months ago. Finished it up not too long ago. And there was a passage here where Daniel sees or gets a little bit of insight into the unseen spiritual conflicts that are going on as he was praying about the future of his, of his people, the Jewish people. Daniel 10, verses 12 through 14 speak of the answer to this prayer and, and the insight that Daniel got of what was taking place that delayed his prayer from being answered for three weeks. It says, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, in other words, when he started praying about the information he's about to receive, and to chasten thyself before thy God, 
Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. The prince of the kingdom of Persia is that principality or that power that was over the demonic elements of the country of Persia, which was the dominating world power at that time. And he prevented this angelic messenger from getting to Daniel for 21 days. But lo, Michael, who is the archangel, he is mentioned here, he's one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remain there with the kings of Persia. Now I'm come to make thee understand what shall, be, shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many times. There is a demonic working behind these things. And Satan has a very organized army. And, uh, he ha and he has it organized such where he has a large concentration in government places and head seats uh, and, and things like that. Why? Because the decisions made at those places dictate what goes on in the rest of the jurisdiction of a country or a state or, prince or a province or whatever the case might be. And, and there's, there is a lot of activity like that. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our, our battle isn't with people. We think that it is, but it is not. But against principalities, again, speaking of those demonic elements, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's really what it is. Now, as we read about these conflicts and difficulties on the news or hear about them that are, that are rising in our day, you know what? It's easy to get concerned, isn't it? Oh, it's very easy. Maybe feel even a sense of instability about tomorrow. Maybe we get fearful. No doubt, and you see this a lot in our nation right now, people are getting angry. Very angry about everything. And as Christian people, you kind of get a little bit disheartened, a little bit like... <laughs> Is there much hope? But God wants us to be at peace. God wants us to know that this is just but a short time. That there is a purpose and a plan behind all of this. And he does so by giving us some insight onto the big picture. That it's not all about what's going on on the day-to-day -day level as much as what's, how that all connects to the big picture that God's trying to bring about. And through this series, we're going to really kind of get into that a little bit. Because we don't want the, the events of the day to dishearten us from living out what God commands us to do and to keep spreading that gospel and to keep reaching out and keep living for Him because it's very easy to let that happen, especially as you see other Christian people fall off by the wayside and compromise and, and get into, you know, just basically giving up. No, God wants us to stay the course. God wants us to be committed to the very end, to finish our race faithfully, so that we may one day say it was worth it all, and we've made a difference while we lived here on earth. Seeing the big picture is meant to motivate us to seek to be spiritually prosperous even in the days we live above all else. <laughs> and, it can, and we can be if we are rooted and grounded in the truth of the Word of God. Our time is short, but our victory is long when we get to the other side. And we'll get into some of those things as we progress. But today, I'd like to talk about really the current world's chaos. Why is it so chaotic in our world? Well, Paul mentions some things within this passage that kind of give us an understanding of why it is the way it is. First off, we see the explosion of sin. The explosion of sin. What will be going on in our world during these last days? Well, Paul communicates to Timothy that these last days will be perilous or dangerous due to the explosion of sin. And that's what you see listed in verses 2 through 3, this explosion of sin. In other words, sin and its negative repercussions will only increase. Will only increase during these days. We see, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. 
from Sasha Turner away. This is a description of the explosions, the explosiveness of sin going on. You know, Jesus even stated in these last days, if you go to Matthew chapter 24, hold your place here in, a, in 2 Timothy, but go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 is called the Olivet Discourse, and it speaks of future events and, and things that progress, and it. it's, it's a very highly prophetical passage. But there's something within it, and we'll probably be in, in and out of this chapter throughout this series at various times. But he mentions here the conditions of, of the days in which are to come, these last days. It says in verse 12 of Matthew 24, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Notice it talks about iniquity abounding, sin abounding. In other words, things are getting worse and worse as far as the, the, the actions of sin and the repercussions that come as a result of sin. And when sin abounds, love grows cold. Love grows cold. You see more hate, if you will. When sin abounds in a life and in the world, <laughs> the hearts of men get colder and colder and colder. In fact, we'll get to eventually at some point uh, about the future events that take place during a time period known as the tribulation period. And it talks about the hardness of the hearts of people. That's when sin will have a whole control of this world for various reasons. But their hearts are so hard. And when sin abounds, love grows cold. In fact, Jesus likened the days before his return to be just like the days of Noah. If you look at the same chapter, Matthew 24, verse 37, it says, But as the, day, but as the days of Noah, Noe or Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that they were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noe entered the, into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. They're going to be like the days of Noah. What were the days of Noah like before that flood? Well, Genesis 6-5 tells us, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That was the condition of the people before the flood. A large growth of sinfulness to the point where God had to do something about it. The point being is that these days will be will have some tumultuous times because of the ramifications of sin, of the sin of the human race, will constantly be increasing. Well, why does it increase so much? Well, <laughs> some very uh, practical reasons. Number one, <laughs> well, just simply the growth of the human population. There's just more sinners committing sin. <laughs> I mean, kind of goes with it, right? More sinners, more sin. <laughs> just happens. Genesis 6-1 mentions how, how the days were when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. Sin continued to increase just simply because the population was growing. And there was, a, and there was just more sinners to commit sin. But number two, the capabilities to sin and spread sin will also increase. And I think a lot of that has to do to the advancement of technology. It has magnified man's ability to sin more readily and rapidly and easily. You know, we all have this favorite thing, right? It's my favorite tool in the world. I spend too much time on it. I, I, I don't know about you. I wish I could go back to the days without this. I really do. But I can't, so I, I, I live with it. But you know what? I could sin by looking up or reading something at the touch of this button. You think about generations past that didn't have anything remotely close to this. But now, I mean, it's at our fingertips at any given moment of the day. And you can read about things, you can watch things that, that would... at just the click of a button because of what's available today. And, and, and there, there's a lot of that online, isn't there? You know, a lot of it is very accessible. So I wish we'd go back in time. Well, you and I can't. And there is a reason why 
this stuff came to be, and I'll explain that here in a moment. Again, it's not going to slow down. In fact, God told Daniel in Daniel 12, 4, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro. <laughs> Spawns like today, isn't it? And knowledge shall be increased. I mean, knowledge has exploded. We can't even keep up with the amount of knowledge that's available today before us. More than any time in history. And one of the reasons is because we can store all that knowledge very readily. I mean, you, you, you think about what can be stored today, the amount of information that can be stored on just a little tiny microchip. It is unbelievable what can be stored on that. And those microchips keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. You know, our, this phone has more power than those first computers did. <laughs> you think about this. It's just incredible. Knowledge is increasing. Say, so why, why did God give this? Well, God knew the population would expand and technology has enabled us to get the gospel further than previous generations. But on top of that, Satan has taken advantage of it too. There's a reason for it. It's not all bad. But at the same time too, the devil has also taken advantage of it and uh, has used it for his own means. Just think if, if, if it was all used for God's means and we put... Bible preaching on all the television stations and the radio stations and godly music and you know what if we all of our text messages were going you know that's really what it was kind of meant for even the social media stuff but what they tend to be used for more like the garbage dump unfortunately even Christians like that tend to be the garbage dump but because of that, man and his tendency to sin has used it for those purposes. But also, number three, the intensity of Satan's warfare. Revelation 12, 12 happens a little further into the future yet, but I think, it, I think you get an idea of the devil's mentality here. It says here, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devils come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Satan knows his days are numbered. In fact, Jesus makes an interesting statement here in Matthew eleven twelve, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. There, there is a real, real intense warfare that we have no clue or we've never seen before, per se, at least with our physical eyes. But if you're if you're in ministry, if you you involve yourself in the things of God, you can sense it. And you know it, because you, 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 you get into it every day. Satan, of course, has been the first to jump on those technological advances of mankind to cater to his agenda and intensify his warfare against people. When they, are, when they probably, again, were given for the promotion of God, amongst other things. Just, but Satan's just after everything. He's trying to do everything he can. To still, he's still got in his mind, evidently, that he can overthrow God. Sin's explosion will be the culprit of the last day's world chaos. And we see that all around us. But secondly, there's also the exaltation of self. Now back in our passage, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, I read verses 2 through 5. I'll read them again here. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. And it goes on and says, Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. <coughs> Nineteen different words or phrases are used to describe these days. However, they are really summed up in the first phrase. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. <laughs> It's really summed up really well. All these things are the result of the sinful self-centeredness of the human race. People will love themselves more than they love others and love God. And that goes in complete contradiction to what Jesus said was the greatest commandment, right? When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, it was to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love others as we love ourselves. 
and on those commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, everything God tells us to do in righteousness is based on the fact that it is motivated by love for God and love for others. That is the basis. That is the base motivation for all the commandments. But all these traits that are mentioned within this passage go completely contrary to this. Because they're not in love with God or loving other people. They, they are loving themselves. Exaltation will not be that of the Savior, but of self. The God of self will be predominantly worshipped, and that is a big God today worshipped. We live in the day of the selfie. I'm not saying if you take a selfie, you're wrong. But, I, but the word selfie, some of you, you know. <laughs> I'll grow them up. Yeah. The selfie. <laughs> what a word, huh? You know that in 2013, that was the word of the year? <laughs> was selfie. <laughs> Anyways, it's such a description of the days we live, though. Isn't it? Selfie. Selfie. Everyone doing what they believe is right for themselves. Without consideration of God or others. The self life. The desire of mankind in these days will be notorious for self gratification and self glorification in some regards. Self gratification and self glorification. The tagline is it's all about me, baby. <laughs> Do what's good for you or do what's best for you. Self-centered living. It's interesting to note that this self-deification was actually the very thing that got the human race into the mess it's in today. You realize that? What did, what did Satan say? Genesis 3, 5 to Eve. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, this is before she did it, that then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods. Knowing both good and evil. That's always been Satan's tagline or selling point. You can be your own God. Because that's what he wants to be. I will be like the Most High, Isaiah 14 talks about. And that's the very lie that he sold to the human race. And has been doing that ever since. You don't need to submit to God. You can live your own life. You can be your own God. You can, you can call the shots. It's all about you. It's all about your self-gratification. It's all about you becoming somebody and something. And... and if you, whatever you have to do to get other people out of the way to get what you want, that's okay. The end justifies the means. And there have been people over the centuries, over the millenniums, that have taken that to the very extremes. To the point they have killed people. They, they have taken over nations and groups of people. Why? Because it's, it's all about themselves. That's the root cause of all of it. Selfish living. Self deification. I can be my own God. And that lie has been repackaged over and over and over again in many forms. Today, in one form, it, it, you see it is in this philosophy called secular humanism. Very prominent in our education system, secular humanism, a philosophy of life where basically man is his own God with no need to submit to anybody else, much less God himself. You can live independent of God. You don't need God, and you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and you can live any way you want. Regardless how neatly packaged that philosophy has been delivered to our minds and appears good and acceptable, most people fail to see that it has been the selfish desires of people that have led to wars, deaths, anarchy, broken lives, and troubled souls throughout human history. It's the self-centeredness of mankind. 
trying to get for themselves whatever they can get for themselves while they're here. And in some cases, if that means taking out other people to get it, they'll do it. Especially if they have the power to do it. The exaltation of self. When we exalt self, these characteristics that we see in this passage come out. And not a one of them has a positive outcome. Not a one of them. God, on the flip side, tells Christians to die to self, right? Not live selfishly, but selflessly. Die to self. Live unto Him. Because that benefits everyone. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 through 15 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then, all, then we're all dead, spiritually speaking. And that we, that he, excuse me, and that he died for all, that they which live, in other words, have been saved, it's referring to, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. That's the purpose of why we live today. Not for self-gratification, not for self-elevation, not for self-deification. Just about anywhere you find the word self attached to it, that's not the way God wants us to live. <laughs> And it makes such a difference in our world if everybody lived like that, wouldn't it? Oh, it would transform everything. Transform absolutely everything. But because of, the, because of self exaltation and, and that philosophy, and that, that is pumped out like <clears throat> you wouldn't believe in our world, we have what we have today. The last days will see a greater self centeredness in the human race. Things we're seeing so grossly occurring every day in a 24-7 news cycle we are consistently exposed to. Selfish people wanting selfish things for self-gratification because they're so empty inside and void of the thing that they really need is a relationship with their Creator found in the salvation through Jesus Christ. That would solve everything. But of course, some will not receive that either. Well, thirdly and finally, the expulsion of sovereignty. The expulsion of sovereignty. Verse 5 makes an interesting statement. It says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Did you know that percentage-wise, the, the number of atheistic people is actually quite low? You know, you'd, you'd be shocked. You'd think, no way. <laughs> I mean, with how loud they can be... Yeah, worldwide, it's estimated that there's only about 7% of the population that's atheistic. 7%. And most of them reside in China, which has been, of course, through communism and things like that, and eradicated some of that. But there's actually a growing host of Christians in China as a result of that, too. Long story, but... <clears throat> Again, you swear that number would be much larger based on what you kind of get exposed to through the news, which, by the way, is a little tailored to an agenda. So why, 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 is it, why is that number a lot lower than what you would think? Well, it's because most people know, at the very least, there is a greater, higher power. Why? Because God hardwired that into the creation Himself. In fact, Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. In other words, the, the things that are made, us, human beings, we understand his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. <clears throat> Everyone has been given the consciousness of God within the soul. It was hardwired into every one of us. Now, not, that doesn't mean that everyone knows who God is specifically, but they know that there's a higher power. They know that there's some sort of God out there. And depending on what we've been exposed to, there are certain, it, 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 it's either to some greater or lesser form. Because you can go to the backwood tribes of, uh, of this world and you will still find them worshiping something 
a higher power of some sort. The world is not naturally atheistic. The world is naturally seeking answers from a spiritual power, much of them which they don't understand. Hence, the, the atheist is just deceiving himself. Like the Bible says in Psalm 53, 1, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Corrupt are they and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. It's very foolish. They're just deceiving themselves. But our passage here indicates something about the other 93% of the world. Okay? That within these days in which we live, there will be a form of godliness, but such that denies the power or, or uh, gets rid of the sovereignty of God or, or God's sovereign, His sovereignty or Him. And what I believe this is referring to is the religious nature of mankind, that they may worship God per se, but it's a religiosity void of God. Man worshiping God the way he wants to worship instead of the way God lays out for him. And that goes on all the time. People going through the motions of worship, but the heart is not there. You know, we can go through the motions of worship. I went, I grew up, and you know, I went through the motions of worship. I remember I, I could probably still do the rendition. <clears throat> it, it, would, it probably wouldn't take a whole lot for me to, to uh, recant everything. But I sat in it for just a few weeks. You know, going through the motions of religiosity is as if the motions are what please God, but... But God doesn't look at the motions as much as He's looking at the heart. Isaiah 29, 13 says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as the people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men, and not the commands of God. What happens there is they expel sovereignty from their worship. You know, that's something that the religious leaders of Jesus' day actually did too. He mentions in Mark 7, 7, How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And they had a lot of doctrines that were man-made versus stuff that can be backed up by <clears throat> the Word of God themselves. Do we realize today we can't worship God any way we choose? You know what I mean? A lot of people are trying to worship God any way they choose. You know, doing things the way they want to do it because, you know, that's what they're comfortable with. I saw an article here not too long ago. I think I shared this with folks. <clears throat> I saw it was like that the old way of church is going away. It's all going online now. You can do it from the comforts of your own home. You know, I, I, I've, I've heard uh, crazy things like confessionals in... in uh, <clears throat> Like drive through uh, situations, like a fast food restaurant. <laughs> of course, I think you can get married that way too in certain parts of this country, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, it's, it's coming to the point where it's like the old uh, Burger King slogan have it your way. And you can't have it your way, it's God's way. We as God's, we as people have no business or really no grounds in which we can dictate how we worship God. He's the one that dictates that because He's the one that we worship. <laughs> Saying, God, I'm going to worship you this way. I'm going to just do it this way. And it doesn't matter if it's biblical or not. It's, it's fine. You know, whatever. You know, it, 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 it's crazy. I heard a story one time about, uh, I guess it was a well-known preacher that had like the Lord's Supper service with soda crackers and Coke. And it's like, really? It's a meaningful experience on the beach, you know. Give me a break. See, that's man just doing whatever he wants to do. You know, there was a couple guys back in the Old Testament that, that decided to offer up some strange fire. And God say, oh, that's okay. Uh, no, he actually put them to death back in those days. A little bit different. You know, God is a little bit 
concern how he how things are done. And we as God's by God's grace try to do it as biblically as we can here. God has specific ways in which he desires to be worshiped. You know, he told the woman at the well there in John chapter 4 and verse 24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in know his truth in connection with his word. God has given us truth, and His Word is to be followed in regards to worship. Well, today, there is such a variety of worship, and much of it does not reflect anything more than the antics of the world. The antics of the world. It, it grieves me to see so many church services today looking more like uh, acts at the Target Center than the things of God. You know what I mean? That grieves me. And they'll get up and say some, some things that, you know, oh, we're just seeking Jesus and all this stuff. And they'll say some of the right things. But the behavior is, is completely contrary to the holiness of God. Well, that's how we get the young people. They're not getting the young people. Do you realize that? They're not getting any of them. Why? Because these newer generations... They talk a lot about the millennials and how they're dropping off from church. That was the group that, that grew up with that stuff. And they're the ones leaving church. Why? Because church is no different than what they do out there. And we had a big problem today. You know, Jesus doesn't need to be reinvented. Our heart needs to be renovated. And the only way you can get that renovated is by showing people who God truly is and how He needs to be feared and honored and worshipped. It, it just doesn't work that way. And it grieves me to think of, of, of the average church today alluring people through the lusts of the flesh, the sinful side of us, versus the beauty and, and wonderfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has to say and how they can actually have joy in their hearts. Instead, it's all about gyrating the flesh. And that just doesn't help anybody. That doesn't change a single soul. And gen the, the newer generations see that and it's like, what, what's it any different? How's it any different than what I could go at the Target Center or downtown Minneapolis or wherever they may live? It's not any different, really. Just slap a little Jesus in there and you think you're good. That doesn't work that way. It doesn't work. And it's proven by what we see in the morality of our nation. It really is. The morality is going down the tubes because we're too busy entertaining the masses instead of teaching the masses what, to say, what God says and what is right. That's what it's supposed to be about. The methods have been anything but counterproductive. Oh, you may swell up a big crowd, but if that, unless that crowd gets right with God and their lives are in tune with the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word, it's worthless. Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world. In other words, don't be like this world. Don't mold or model yourself after this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, God wants transformation in the heart that comes from being in line with His will, basically His Word. You can't do that when you're, when you're behaving like the world. The last thing the world needs is another imitation of itself when it comes to church. You know what I mean? People are supposed to see something different in church. Not something that's similar to what they're experiencing out there. But sadly, that those lines are blurring and blurring every day. And it's not helped our cause, it's actually hurt it. I don't believe you've got to be like the world to win the world. I think you need to be like Jesus Christ to win the world. And that'll make all the difference. Having a form of godliness. Not necessarily atheistic, but they're denying the power of it. And that is a growing issue in our day. Actually, it's been going on for decades now. We're finding places that you can hear, Thus saith the Lord, are becoming a rarity. And it shouldn't be that way. 
The book of Micah talks about a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread or anything like that, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And we have a growing famine in this land. A land where we boast of our Christianity, but, but in a lot of cases it's not as strong as what we think it is because of the philosophies that have, have become predominant just to garner a crowd. May God help us today not to expel sovereignty from our worship, but to get in line with what He wants and how He wants it done so that we may honor Him and be salt and light in a world that desperately needs it. Yeah, this world's in some chaos. These are some of the reasons why. But just because the world is in chaos does not mean our lives have to be in chaos. It just simply means we need to be aligned with Him. You know, in Noah's day, I'll probably get to this at some point more thoroughly, but Noah was the only righteous man, and he is considered one of the most righteous men who have ever lived. And he lived in a day in which he could have had every excuse to, to go along with it, but he didn't. Why? Because he walked with God and he stayed close to Him. That's all we need to do today as well. Let's stand to our feet here this morning.